In this program, you will find out about the first colonists, where they came from, and why they left their homes. What was life like for the colonists? What were the hardships they faced? You will learn about the Huguenots, the mysterious lost colony, the Jamestown and Plymouth settlements. Why did some settlements fail while others survived? Within just 50 years of Columbus's and Cabot's voyages to the New World, all the major European powers had entered the race to establish profitable colonies in North and South America. Spain and Portugal would continue to plunder and colonize the lands they claimed in the South. To the North, the territory that would one day become the United States was still largely unknown. But that would soon change. The vast, unspoiled wilderness, the fertile soil and temperate climates would draw colonists from France, England, and the Netherlands seeking new lives, freedom, and wealth at tremendous cost to the new land's native inhabitants. For many Europeans during the 1500s, the idea of freedom and a new way of life was becoming increasingly important. In France, the French wars of religion were dividing the population into a civil war as conflicts between the Catholics and Protestants began to break out across the countryside. The king, of course, Henry IV, um, was, uh, adhered to the Catholic religion. And, and th throughout the course of the 1500s, um, the Protestants in France had a harder and harder time getting by. They weren't getting the kinds of jobs that they would want to get. They weren't having the kinds of um, official positions. They were persecuted. And over time, they began to see the New World as a way that they could get out from under this persecution. Some members of the Protestant religion, under the leadership of Admiral Gaspar de Coligny, formed a religious political group called the Huguenots. They were determined to protect their Protestant beliefs from the cruel persecution of the Catholic crown at any cost. Coligny sponsored an expedition to cross the Great Atlantic under Jean Rabot and René Laudonniere. Sailing in a small ship across the Atlantic to the east coast of Florida, they continued north until they reached the mouth of a large river, which they named the River of May, today called the St. John's. Jean Ribot claimed possession of the country in the name of the King of France by engraving the French royal arms onto an elevated pillar of stone near the harbor. Ribot decided to lay the foundations of their colony along the channel of Port Royal off the South Carolina coast and immediately began work on a fort which they called Charles Fort in honor of the young boy king, King Charles, who had recently taken the throne in France. When the work was underway, Ribot and Laudonniere left a number of men to watch over the small fort while they returned to France to report their discoveries and to secure larger supplies for the colony. But when they reached France, they found a civil war had broken out between the Protestants and the Catholics. It was impossible to get either men or money for the colony in Florida. So the men at Charlesfort were left to their own fate. They were out adequate food, they're without provisions and supplies, so they decide to construct their own boats in order to go back to France and they use their their sheets and their shirts to make sails and they uh, are just barely surviving. They're eating their leather belongings in order to get some sustenance, but uh, they do construct these boats and they miraculously sail off to France and make it there. On June 24, 1564, Laudonniere returned with a colonizing expedition to the River of May. He selected a wooded bluff to establish settlement and set to work immediately building a fort, which he named Fort Caroline. A year later, he was joined by Jean Ribot, who delivered much needed supplies. The Spanish, by this time, had established their foothold along the Atlantic coast of Florida. They were not interested in settling colonies, but wanted to protect their fleet of ships riding the offshore Gulf Stream home to Spain. Seeing that Fort Caroline was being constructed not only by Frenchmen, but by French Protestants, deadly enemies of the Catholic monarchy in Spain, 
The Spanish crown sent Don Pedro Menendez de Avias, captain general of the Indies, to destroy the Huguenots. Menendez and his Spanish soldiers constructed a Spanish fort called St. Augustine on the Florida coast, just south of the Huguenots, then marched overland through the swamps to surprise them with an attack from the rear. Menendez wrote triumphantly to the king in Spain, I put Jean Rabot and all the rest of them to the knife, judging it necessary to the service of the Lord our God and your majesty. More than 500 French Huguenots lay dead in the Florida surf. The French attempt to plant a colony along the Atlantic coast of North America had ended in disaster. A young English military commander and writer named Walter Raleigh, who had begun his career in France, established himself at the English court and soon became a favorite courtier of Queen Elizabeth I. England was determined to establish settlements in the New World and in 1584, Queen Elizabeth renewed a patent which gave Raleigh the right to explore, colonize, and govern new settlements in America. The Queen insisted that all the laws passed in this new land must be in harmony with the laws of England. On April 27, 1584, Raleigh sent out an expedition to explore the American coast and decide on the site for the future English colony. Sailing through the West Indies, they landed on Roanoke Island off the Carolina coast in early July. Here they were given a great feast by the Indians of a small village in Roanoke. And after two months of exploring and trading with the native people, they returned to England with reports that the coastal region was densely populated with very handsome and goodly people. These Indians, the most southerly of the Algonquin coastal people, enjoyed prosperous lives with abundant hunting, fishing, and farming. The chief of the Roanoke region, Chief Wingina, saw the English explorers as potential allies who could help him extend his authority to other surrounding villages. So he granted them permission to establish their settlement on Roanoke Island. When Raleigh presented Queen Elizabeth with the reports of the expedition, she was extremely pleased that he had named the new territory Virginia for the Virgin Queen and promptly knighted Raleigh for his successful efforts. He would now forever be known as Sir Walter Raleigh. In April 1585, Sir Walter Raleigh sent out a colonizing expedition consisting of 108 men, with Ralph Lane appointed as governor. Under his leadership, the colony explored the area and relied upon the Indians to help them find food. They'd never been in the country. They really didn't know what the country was about. They didn't know how to hunt. They didn't know how to fish. Most of them had never been outside London in, in their entire lives. So they had no idea how to, how to help themselves. When the natives cut off support, Ralph Lane, the military governor of the colony, decided that the natives were guilty of treason. War finally broke out in the spring of 1586. And although the colonists won an easy victory, unrest and distress continued to worsen. Raleigh sent out another expedition to America on May 8, 1587, with more than 100 men, women, and children. He appointed John White governor of the colony. They had been instructed by Raleigh to proceed on to the Chesapeake region, where a more suitable English base for action against the Spanish might be established. But the ship's pilot refused to sail further, and the expedition was forced to remain on Roanoke Island. The Algonquin people were by now extremely distrustful of the English intruders, and intermittent fighting began to break out between them and the settlers. That August, in 1587, John White's daughter Eleanor gave birth to a little girl named Virginia. She was the first English child to be born in the New World. Shortly afterward, a controversy over who would return to England sprang up and it was finally decided that White should go. Reluctantly, he sailed for England, and he was not able to return to Roanoke for two years. When he returned to the island in 1590, he discovered no trace of the colony, 
except the word Croatoan cut on the doorpost of the palisade. The colonists had agreed to leave a sign if they moved from Fort Rollins. When he returned in 1590, everything was gone. The real mystery to this story is not what happened to the people, because a wilderness the size of America in 1590 could very easily absorb 116 people without a trace. The, 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 the loss of the people comes as no surprise to, to historians. But the entire town vanished. The fate of Raleigh's colony remains a mystery. It has been assumed that the colonists went to the friendly Croatoans, but it has also been suggested that, like the Huguenots before them, they had become victims of the Spanish. Today, many historians believe that the men and women probably went to Croatoan, an Indian settlement north of Roanoke, and lived out the rest of their lives beside the Algonquin villagers, but the first English settlers would forever be remembered as the lost colony. Their disappearance and ultimate fate is one of the enduring mysteries of colonial history. After the failures at Roanoke Island, Sir Walter Raleigh's investment was viewed as a great financial loss, and the English crown was in no position to invest in such risky ventures. The next step toward colonization came from English merchants who pooled together the money of their investors and formed joint stock companies. Queen Elizabeth's successor to the crown, King James I, granted a charter in 1606 to a joint stock company with two branches, the Virginia Company of London and the Virginia Company of Plymouth, to colonize North America. The London branch was given rights to settle lands along the coast of present-day North Carolina and Virginia. The Plymouth branch was given rights farther north around New England. In December of 1606, the London Company sent out three ships to create a colony in Virginia with 105 men and boys. In May 1607, the settlers landed on a marshy island in the James River. It would become the first English settlement in the New World, Jamestown, Virginia. As most of the settlers were considered gentlemen in England, they were not used to manual labor. There were very few farmers or toolmakers with the skills that were needed to live in the wilderness. By mid-June, the settlers had managed to build a triangular fort and finished planting their first field of grain, but quickly half of the settlers died of hunger and disease. The rest survived, primarily through the efforts of Captain John Smith, a seasoned soldier, explorer, and very practical person. When John Smith arrived, the colony was falling apart. Seventy starved to death in no time. There are stories of reduction to cannibalism. John Smith made a rule. This is not his exact words, and to be honest, we don't have his exact words. If you don't work, you don't eat. It was John Smith who approached the Indians, a united group of the Algonquin tribes under the powerful rule of Chief Powhatan. Powhatan's daughter was Pocahontas. John Smith was captured. He was hauled before the chief. Powhatan was going to smash his brains out, or have his brains smashed out with a war club. Powhatan's beautiful daughter, Pocahontas, very young, only about 10 or 11 at the time, rushes in and throws her body across John Smith. Now that's what the observer saw that didn't understand the culture. There's a new idea today that what happened to John Smith wasn't that he was about to be executed and saved but that he was a member, a, a participant of a religious ceremony in which he didn't understand what was going on. That this was a ritual, rebirth. By January, when Captain Newport arrived with 120 more settlers, the original colony had dropped from over 100 to 40, and the settlement teetered on the edge of disaster. The company council that governed the colony finally put Captain John Smith in charge, and the chances for survival began to look better. 
Soon after, the gentlemen were producing pitch, tar, and soap ashes, tending the livestock, and preparing the ground for crops. What John Smith did for the colony at Jamestown was change the way the colony looked at itself. It changed the colonists from a group of men grabbing at the soil for scraps of gold to men seeing gold growing from the soil. The struggling colony suffered a major setback in the fall of 1609 when John Smith was burned in a gunpowder explosion and was forced to return to England. With his departure, the discipline again began to decline in the colony and the relationships with the Indians also began to grow sour. Another group of colonists arrived from England, but without the necessary provisions. The winter of 1609 became known as the Starving Time, when 75 to 80 percent of the Jamestown colonists died, leaving only 60 survivors. It is believed that Pocahontas, meanwhile, had saved the lives of three more Englishmen who had angered Powhatan. When the English realized the influence she had over her father, Pocahontas was kidnapped and taken to Jamestown to force cooperation from her father. She studied the English language, was baptized into the Church of England, and given the English name Rebecca. At the age of 18 or 19, she married a colonist named John Rolfe, and relations soon improved. Around 1612, John Rolfe planted some West Indies tobacco seeds in the fertile soil of Virginia. He also developed a method to cure the leaves so they could be shipped over long distances. The Jamestown tobacco was an instant success in England, and the obsession for finding gold gave way to a new obsession for planting tobacco. Colonists planted it everywhere, even in the streets. By 1614, the colony had built what would become the beginnings of a town with two rows of framed timber houses, each two and a half stories tall, three storehouses, and a reinforced palisade. Several houses were also situated outside the fortifications. Since the colonists soon found that tobacco crops quickly wore out the soil, they were constantly looking for new fields. They started taking over Indian lands, and the Jamestown settlement began to grow north along the James River. By 1619, Jamestown had the semblance of a small English town with its church, school, and inn. However, the colonists lived primarily a scattered plantation life. That year, the first shipload of women and girls arrived in Virginia, also the first Dutch trading ship with a cargo of 20 Africans. The Africans joined the Jamestown settlement as indentured servants. They too were promised a parcel of land after completing their period of servitude. The London Company management suggested that the people of Virginia might have a hand in governing themselves. The governor was ordered to call an election. Above everything else, the company wanted the colonists to, to grow tobacco or do whatever it would take for the company investors to get a return on their investments. So they, as, a, as a, almost like carrot on a stick, they offer a representative type of government so the colonists can have some semblance of order. Then, in March 1622, the Powhatan Indians attacked Jamestown, killing over 300 colonists. They resented the loss of their tribal lands. Skirmishes would continue for several years. In England, King James blamed this on colony mismanagement, and he revoked the charter of the Virginia Company of London. Jamestown, Virginia would now be a royal colony, and the crown, not the company, would appoint the governors and council members. Jamestown was now the first English colony firmly planted on American soil, but all was not well at home in England. Like the religious wars in France, religious conflict in England was greater than it had ever been. In the early 1600s, all English people were required by law to belong to the Anglican Church, but many secretly kept their Catholic beliefs and hoped to someday be able to practice their religion freely again. 
Puritans and separatists, on the other hand, felt that the Anglican Church of England had not gone far enough and wanted to purify all traces of the Catholic tradition out of the church. They wanted to do away with the elaborate ceremonies of the church and simplify the services. A small group of separatists, as they were called, became committed to finding a safe haven in which to live and worship. They met with the London Company who had set up the colony in Jamestown and were able to obtain a charter to settle in Virginia and set up a trading post. On September 16, 1620, the separatists began their pilgrimage and set sail out of England on a ship called the Mayflower. There were 101 passengers on board, many of them separatists, but they would all come to be known as pilgrims. The voyage across the Atlantic Ocean was rough and stormy, and it became apparent as they reached the North America coastline that they had been blown off course. They were not in Virginia as they had planned, but much further north near the New England area that John Smith had written about. On November 21st, two days after sighting land, 41 of the passengers crowded into the main cabin to decide what to do next. The London Company had no authority in this region. One of the non-separatists reasoned that now none had the power to command them. So they agreed to create a government by common consent and prepared a document called the Mayflower Compact. In this document, they pledged to join one another in a political body to make just and equal laws for the general good of the colony. The harbor that they sailed into had earlier been named Plymouth by Captain John Smith, who had navigated the northern coast some years before. They decided to make their settlement on its shore and to call the colony Plymouth, like the harbor. Being November, the cold New England winter was already arriving, and the Pilgrims' first months in the New World were the most difficult. They had to endure the freezing cold, intense hunger, and disease from the lack of nutrition and the elements. Half of the 101 settlers would die that first winter alone. As winter began to turn into spring, the survivors, thin and weak from the difficult winter, finally made contact with some friendly Indians and gladly accepted their help. One of their best friends was a Pawtucket Indian named Squanto, who not only brought them food, but showed them the best places to fish and hunt. Squanto had had been uh, a prisoner of an earlier English expedition and had actually been taken to England. And he knew English. Can you imagine the pilgrims arriving and actually meeting an Indian who can speak their language? One day, Squanto announced that the great chief, Massasoit, was nearby. One of the settlers, Edward Winslow, marched out in full armor to meet him. They exchanged gifts and food and developed a treaty of peace and cooperation that lasted 54 years. As the Mayflower prepared to make the return voyage to England, not one of the settlers chose to go back. The spring and summer of 1621 were spent in planting and tending some 20 acres of corn, in trading with the Indians, and in sawing down trees for building and making clapboards that could be sent back to England on the first boat. As the summer months went by, the pilgrims began getting ready for their first harvest in preparation for the coming winter. And in October 1621, Massasoit and some 90 Indians joined the pilgrims for a feast. The celebration lasted for three days. After this celebration, the governor of Plymouth, William Bradford, declared that a day of thanksgiving would be observed when the harvest was especially good. Toward the end of November, a ship called Fortune sailed into Plymouth Harbor with 35 passengers. Many of the passengers were relatives and friends of the pilgrims. The Fortune also brought a patent, or charter, from the newly formed Council for New England. It confirmed the Mayflower Compact, recognized the Plymouth Colony as legal, and stated that the colony would be given land boundaries after seven years. The colonists were now firmly planted in the soil of Plymouth, and the small colony would continue to grow slowly. It would only be a matter of time before more and more colonists arrived in America seeking fortune and freedom. To review, the first colonists to North America came for a variety of reasons. To escape persecution, 
seeking adventure and wealth, as hired workers for religious freedom. Colonists with skills such as farming, sewing, carpentry, and cooking fared much better than those unable or unwilling to perform such tasks. Women played a decisive role in the first colonies. Cooperation between colonists and Native Americans often meant the difference between success or failure in the early settlements. <laughs> 